Angie and welcome to another episode of A Book Chat With. Today I have the pleasure of being here with Kawhi Strong Washburn whose stunning debut novel Sharks in the Time of Saviors is coming out in March. Hi Kawhi, how are you? Hi, I'm good Seji, how are you? I am very good, a bit tired but good. <laughs> so Yeah, you just came back from London, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, how uh, long were you there? Uh, I was there for about a week or so, but um, okay. I took the train back, so that took like um, a really long time. Yeah, so I can only assume how long the train ride is. <laughs> but I guess it's good for the environment, so. It is, it is. Yeah, I wish we had something like that in the United States. It's a problem right now. The trains here all run off of diesel, so. Oh, wow. You know, the, the carbon emissions that are associated with train travel in the United States are not that is not nearly as good for the environment to travel by train here as it is in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I wish it were something that we had a better grasp on. But, but thank you for taking the train. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to start things off, could you uh, talk a bit about what Sharks in the Time of Saviors is all about? Yeah, yeah. This is a hard question for me a lot of times because I feel like the novel is, is complex and so describing it succinctly has always been a challenge. But I think what I can say best is that it's a it's a family saga that centers on a working class family in Hawaii that experiences a miracle and that miracle reshapes entirely what the family thinks about itself and its heritage and forces each of the characters in in these different directions and the novel then becomes about not only how they can figure out who they are but how they can grapple with the implications of this miracle and, and find their way back to each other. Mm -hmm. At a high level, I think that's how I can describe it. <laughs> it has a lot to do with class and race and, and you know, colonialism in the United States and how all those things intertwine around issues of, you know, under environmental sustainability and, and a lot of other things as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that kind of like perfectly encompasses the, uh, the story. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, good job. <laughs> I keep working on it because people mm -hmm. ask me and I keep failing to describe it well. <laughs> well, it seems to be improving, so I guess you'll be all set for, for the tour in a couple of days. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so um, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to say. I think that so the image of the shark and the image of the sharks rescuing a child, which is one of the opening images happens in that first chapter, right? That to me was, it was just something that came to me as, a, as an image. I don't know where it came from initially, but it, it was in my head and sort of floating around. And I just let it sit in my subconscious for a long time. And at the time I didn't think it was going to be any sort of story or novel. And I was writing other things at the time, short stories, another novel that I, that I ended up shelving. But I kept coming back to that image. So then I started spending time asking questions about like, well, if we have this idea of a child being saved from drowning by sharks, then what is this child doing? Who is this child's family? Why is this child in the water? You know, and so I just started asking a lot of questions. And once I had some ideas about where the story might go, then I started thinking about some of the experiences I had growing up in Hawaii and what it was like leaving the islands and going to the greater United States and, and just some of the things that I experienced as a result of that and, and trying to tie those together with that story in a way that didn't make it autobiographical, but that I thought was a unique story. So it just sort of built between, you know, an organic combination of my experiences as well as this image. And I don't know where that image came from. So that image of like the, the kid getting, um, I guess, saved by the shark, um, that does kind of, was that kind of already connected to like um, Hawaiian mythology when you had that image? I don't think it was initially, but pretty quickly that, I think it was just the sort of thing that I, having grown up there and having been, you know, the mythology of, of Hawaii just sort of exists around you when you live there, especially where I grew up, which is Honoka, which is a small, it's a small town, it's a very rural part of the islands that like Hawaiian mythology is just a part of everyday life. At least it was in my experience. And so I think that it's hard to, I would just assume that that image 
is informed by having grown up around that mythology. It wasn't a deliberate interpretation of mythology initially, but pretty quickly after the image showed up in my head and I thought about it, it seemed like that was just sort of where, uh, either where it came from or what made the most sense in, in, ter in terms of placing it in in Hawaii. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, <laughs> it's sort of an organic true. thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, like with regards to uh, Hawaiian Hawaiian mythology, I don't think that uh, there are a lot of people who are like very familiar um, with that, or even at all like the history and the culture. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe talk a bit about like um, what uh, Kahunas and Amakuas are? Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of different ideas about what what gods are in in Hawaii and in that mythology and you know the 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 mythology is fascinating in the way that it, it takes the natural world and ascribes deities to a lot of it right and so for example there's a there's a goddess named Pele which she is a goddess of volcanoes and fire and because there are active volcanoes in whole like to this day there are active volcanoes in Hawaii you can sort of see that aspect of the islands playing itself out and have this mythology associated with it that, that, that is part of ancient Hawaii mythology. And that, that translates into a lot of different parts of the natural world. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of the Amakua is, it's a concept of a, a deity that is typically an animal that is a return of a family's ancestors. It can be a couple of different things, but I think the most the most often encountered version of the Amakua in Hawaiian mythology is that version, which is uh, a member of our family is returning to us through an animal in order to give us guidance and protection. And so that's sort of what the the sharks in this story, that's what the family comes to believe the shark event is and the ongoing interaction they have with sharks later on. Mm -hmm. The idea of a kahuna is... You know, a lot of times it gets interpreted as a priest or priestess or like a, a shaman or, you know, so in some countries they might call that like a witch doctor or something like that. I don't really like the connotation of witch, but it's an idea of somebody that has a, a stronger interaction with the, with the gods and the natural world than a common person might, okay. I think is, is one way you can describe it. And so kahunas in in the history of Hawaii were usually, they were, uh, what's, what's a good, what's a good word for it? They were like associates to, to the royalty in the islands often. And so they worked with different chiefs as somebody that helps to interpret and guide them in their, in their, you know, interactions with the world in a way that kept them compatible with the needs of the gods, if that makes sense. So they were kind of like a, not an oracle, but something like a cross between an oracle and a and a and a shaman, or like I don't I don't like the term witch doctor, but I think a lot of people think of that, and that's what yeah. they think of. So, uh -huh. and and are there still like um, a lot of those type of people? Um, I would say active in Hawaii. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that there would be a lot of people that would necessarily consider themselves kahunas or would give themselves that title because it. It's such a sacred title and one that because of the way that religion has changed in Hawaii is something that I think a lot of people would just consider too sacred to to kind of claim in, in modern in modern Hawaii, especially for the majority of people. But I will say there are a lot of people that are historians and scholars of native Hawaiian culture that are very that are very astute and very grounded in the implications of ancient Hawaiian beliefs in modern society, and so at some level are a sort of a sort of a cipher or interpreter of Hawaiian mythology and its implications for modern day life. And so, it, in that respect, there are still a lot of people who look at ancient Hawaiian beliefs and the mythology that is that predated European contact and value those things and look for ways to bring those things into contemporary Hawaiian life. And so that to me is similar to a kahuna, okay. um, but I, I, I don't think there are very many people that seriously today would call themselves a, a kahuna. I'm sure there are some people that, that might do that, but the majority of the, of the people I've encountered that are Hawaiian scholars and the like wouldn't necessarily call themselves that or, or want to. So. Okay, 
okay interesting so like the thing that um is obviously i guess unique compared to like the 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 family sagas that like you now see like that are coming out is of course like um like that he wrote it using like from the perspective of like hawaiian mythology and like how heavily ingrained that is in the story um would you say that that is something um very intrinsic to like hawaiian stories yeah that's a good question and it's it's i don't want to speak for the larger body of of hawaiian literature that exists because i think it's a spectrum and Mm -hmm. and people you know some some writing even contemporary hawaiian writing will be much more grounded in what you can consider modern Hawaiian life, right? And, and, and just what it means to, you know, I don't know, be living in a city in, in Hawaii and struggling to find a job or even just something as simple as like, I'm in a relationship that is a hard relationship and I happen to be living in Hawaii, mm-hmm. you know, and th- those yeah. things have nothing to do with, with ancient Hawaiian culture or the interplay between those things in America or anything like that. Uh, but there are certainly other authors who have also talked about those aspects of, of Hawaiian culture and bring them into their stories. So, so things kind of exist on a scale. I think a few of the authors that have done it, one that springs to my mind who's, for who it has been front and center is Kiana Davenport. And she wrote a trilogy that started with a book called Shark Dialogues as well. You know, So she also wrote about a, diff- a slightly different interpretation of what I would call the Amakua, as well as as sort of what the ancient Hawaiian belief system is, and it's this huge saga that spans like hundreds of years in Hawaii. So it's totally different than than what I wrote, but she touches on some of the same same things. Okay, so um, I was wondering when when did you start writing um, the book? Actually, yeah, it's so hard to know because it's been. It's such a long time that it has been a part of my life. And I think what I've been telling people when they ask me this is that I think from this year when it gets published, if you go backwards in time, I think about 10 years oh. is when I actually started writing it, writing it down versus the period of time in which it was in my head, but not you know committed to, to paper yet at all. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was about 10 years and I, I, I moved through, I think three different cities. Uh, you know, I had several family members pass away. I I was married, I, like I'm married and had two children and that all happened while I was writing the novel. Oh, wow. So there've been a lot of changes in my life that mm-hmm. have been happening while the novel, while I was writing the novel. <laughs> it's okay. insane to think about. <laughs> yeah, 10 years is, uh, is quite some time. Yeah, yeah, well, I've always had other jobs and other things, right? Like I've never been a writer that, I've never been employed just as a writer or a uh-huh. student that was a writer, right? So I didn't go to, in the United States, there's there's like a, a master's of fine arts degree that you can get that a lot of writers these days get. And that gives them a few years in which they, they just study writing, right? And so they have time to just write and read and write and read. And I never had that window of time. I probably could have written it a lot more quickly if the only thing I was doing was writing. Mm-hmm. No. But I was always working and, and, you know, living another life that, that I had to fit the writing into. So mm-hmm. it took a lot longer. No, definitely. I mean, I can imagine a lot of um, writers in the States, even who I've spoken to, um, like worked at as like a librarian or something else. And then they would like write in between. So where yeah. did you kind of um, decide that you wanted to start writing? Yeah, so that would probably be, if, ten, if it's been 10 years since I started writing this book, then I feel like it was probably another four or five years before that, that I had started to really consider trying to write something, right? Like being like, well, I want to I create a piece of art that I put out in the world as a writer, you know, versus just sort of thinking about it in your head, like, oh, maybe I can write something once. I think when I actually was like, well, I'm going to try and write something and get it published. I think that probably happened four or five years before this novel was written. So I guess 14 or 15 years. That's kind of crazy. It makes me feel really old. (laughs) (laughs) I I turned 40 this year, but now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, I think it was right around when I was 25 or so is when I first Mm -hmm. thought about trying to write. So. Mm -hmm. And, and was there something specific that like really spurred you on or was it just kind of like this thought of like, I think I really just want to start writing. I think it was, it's just really loving reading, right? As a reader, like there's, 
there's just a certain type of magic that happens for me as a reader when I read a book that I can't get from any other art form. I mean, every art form has its own experience, right? When you listen to music or even if you go to a live music event, that's a certain experience of art. If you go to a gallery where there's art that has been painted or sculptures that are there, that's also a different type of, of experience of art. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same thing with theater and all the other art forms that are out there, but the, there are things about reading and being a reader that um, I just, you know, I just love books. And so I, I think I've always wanted to be a part of, of that conversation and to be somebody that not only loves reading, but tries to, to, to build my own art that, that does that same magic thing, you know? And so I think you know, the book that probably put, put me over the edge was a book by an American author named Dennis Johnson. It came out quite a while ago. And it's, at least in the United States, the title is Jesus' Son. And it's a set of linked short stories about in, I'm, I'm gonna simplify it, but it is basically a set of linked short stories about this, this sort of down on his luck, uh, drug addict, it, it kind of a, he's kind of a terrible person. And, he, and there's this series of stories about his life that you find out. And there are these, there's something incredible about those stories. They just, they just affect me in a way no other writing has. And at the time that I read them, they just struck me very specifically in a way that, that it just changed the way I felt about the world and about being a human. And so that I, when that happened, I was sort of like, well, what, what was that? I read this book and I just feel that the way it makes me feel is like nothing I've ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. I want to be part of that, right? How can I be a part of that and, and, and not just be a reader, but maybe a writer? So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that was where it started. Oh, that's so cool. No, definitely. I feel like there's something so magical about like just picking up a book and then finishing it and then just like kind of like going through the sort of transformation in a sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that that's, I think that at its best, that's how, I think every art aspires to that, but I think for me as a reader, I can still point to specific books I've read and I know that I'm not the same person now uh, that I was before I read them, right? Like something in me has changed by reading that book and it's such an incredible experience as a reader and I think it's, mm -hmm. it's something, yeah, I don't know, to, to aspire towards as a writer as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so one of the things that um, I really um, enjoyed about your writing specifically was that um, kind of like how strong the imagery is, like um, the all of the scenes that you write, like the, the pictures you paint are so, so vivid. And um, I was curious to know um, how you kind of like developed that writing style. Was it something you um, specifically seek out to achieve? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I. I, it's, it's one of the things about writing that I just have had to work on a lot, right? I think you just work as a writer. I certainly spend a lot of time working on craft and technique and, and, and just building scenes, right? The actual work of taking whatever's in your head and transferring it into paper in a way that, at least for me, I'm always looking to heighten the experience, right? Like I don't want, I always challenge myself to have a book that I write, or not even a book, just a story, whatever piece of writing I write, I want it to, I want it to feel, I want it to be the sort of experience you can't get from a movie or anything like that. Not because I don't like movies or television shows or any of those things, but I, I want, I want to bring out the parts of, of reading specifically about literature that are specific to literature that are an experience you can't get anywhere else. And I think some of that comes from, from pushing yourself to, to have the words string together in a way that makes them bigger than just, you know, the straightforward sort of writing that you can still describe a thing and people will read it and they'll see that thing in their heads. But if it's, if for me as a writer, if it's too straightforward or too, too lacking in sort of the heightened language that, that literature is capable of, uh, then it feels like it misses a little bit of that magic. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm always working on how do I, how do I take the physical world and render it in a way that feels beyond the ability of a camera to capture right so that it's not this isn't the same as if somebody were to film this this you know, right like if somebody were to film this valley i don't want the experience of that in the book to be the same and so that that's, i always am trying to figure out how can i use words to to deliver an experience that is not like the experience you would get visually for instance mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so talking a, a bit more about that um, imagery, you have uh, Nainoa who has um, this gift which he can use to heal animals and peoples. And um, there are a couple of passages in the book that describe that process of when he's sort of like um, touching the bodies and trying to fix them. Um, those yeah. are actually my favorite parts um, of the book. <laughs> um, but uh, again, they're very, he- like, very imagery heavy and there's a lot of use of um, colors to describe yeah. like the feeling and the things like that. And, and how, how did you come up with that way of uh, describing that healing process? And did you, and had you kind of like, uh, I don't know, considered other ways of, of fitting it? Yeah, that was, I, it's, I took a lot of work to figure out what I wanted to settle on for those experiences. I, I, th- I think the thing that I was trying to figure out is I wanted to have this, this sort of, interconnectedness between the book at some level in my mind speaks to an interconnectedness between the natural world and the human experience. And I wanted to figure out a way to have, because so much of that experience happens primarily through Nainoa, he's the one who we actually later on, some of that happens through some of the other characters, but early on the, the first person we experience it through is Nainoa. And I wanted to, again, you know, have it be something that was heightened and try to speak to an experience that, that I don't feel has been necessarily rendered uh, in any other art forms I've, I've experienced and to have it be something surprising, right? To not just have it be a straightforward, um, you know, the feeling of, of, say, for instance, touching somebody's body and just, I don't know, feeling, feeling the pain in that body or feeling the you know, the wound on that body or things like that, but to actually translate it into this sort of, I don't know, transcendent experience or something like that. And so the the colors were something that emerged at some point where I thought taking the idea of an emotion and turning it into a color, it felt like a way to do that, to make it something that was a little bit heightened and, and transcendent. And I, it's something, I just really liked it when I did it, right? When I worked through it and all of a sudden I was, I kept trying to challenge myself to describe the things in some new and surprising way. And I it took, I had to play with it for a while. And when I settled on it at some point, some of the things being, being colors, I was like, Oh, well that, if that feels to me like some, this bigger thing, it just was a sort of almost a serendipitous moment in which I was like, Oh, this feels really good. This feels like a way to do the thing in the way that I've been searching for. And, and so I just sort of settled on that. But it, it's hard with colors because I also, I'm, I'm always looking for a way to do it beyond any one sense so that if somebody that's that's blind or that has never experienced colors uh, comes to the book and reads it, then they're not, you know, they're not sort of disconnected from the book. But it's so hard to do that, you know, for every mm-hmm. situation. So. No, of course. No. So um, also, um, so the way this book is structured is you have um, all these chapters and every character um narrates like a different um chapter and um what i notice uh, is that like the voices of each and every character each and every family member is um so distinct so that even like without knowing like who is talking you you can just read the, a few a couple of sentences and you're like oh okay that's that's the person was it hard trying to find um the voices for <laughs> each t- character <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was incredibly hard because none of them, none of them are my voice. And so it took a lot of work to take, to take the way I might have described something or the way I might have felt about something and, and translate that into what I thought the character's voice was. That was incredibly difficult. I think if I had known from the start how hard that was going to be, I might not have done it. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, it, it took so many drafts. Like a lot of the early drafts were really less about the plot and the structure and more about just trying to figure out the characters and their voices and how to make them distinct at the same time as making them consistent and believable. And they also, it also spans a large portion of their lives, right? So you have them as children earlier and those, that, those sections are in the past tense but they're rendered in the first person as if that past tense moment were happening when the character is still a child. So you have this version of the child of the the character's voice that is a younger version of their voice. And then you have a version of their voice, which is the older version of their voice. And so I had to both manage that passage of time and how it changed the character's voice while at the same time, making each voice distinct 
and also making sure each voice was not me. <laughs> it was not my like way of speaking, speaking and thinking. Uh, so it was like incredibly challenging. That took that took a really long time. I don't want to say years, but it probably took years. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't work on it exclusively for years, but it took I think several drafts until it was at a point where that part of the the novel felt like it came together. It was really challenging. Uh, and I still think I mess it up in some places. I can still read parts of it and be like, ah, that's not quite as consistent as it should be. But, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I think I think we are always like our, I guess, like strictest critic, largest, biggest critic in the end. So yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, think absolutely. there'll be a lot of people who, who will like figure all of those small things out. Um, but would you yeah. reckon that that was like the hardest part of the entire process? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, looking back on it, I think the place that I struggled the most was probably with that, that aspect of it. And I think one of the things that, that is a challenge as a result of that is in this novel and in general, when I write the plot and the story is at some level an outgrowth of the characters. Right. And so mm -hmm. until I really understand the characters, it's, it's hard to have the plot and the story move in a way that is true, right? Because if you can't figure out, if a character is in a situation and you don't know the character well enough to really know how they're going to react in that situation, then well, then what happens next? Because you're like, I don't know, because I don't know how the character, you know, so then you get stuck in a situation where you're trying to figure out the character uh, and the, the plot might, or, or this event of any, at any given moment, this scene, it might be pushing the character or, or it can act as a forcing function to make the character react or to do something, but you don't know the character well enough yet to really know if the thing they're going to do is the right thing. And so you end up spending a lot of time having to revise large sections of the work in which the character's external actions don't agree with, with how they would have been internally in a way that makes the, the story cohesive. And, and so trying to do that when I still haven't figured out the voices of the characters and things like that makes those other things really challenging. So I would get to a point where I kind of, didn't want to spend more time working on the character's voice and trying to get that as consistent as possible, but still wanted to make progress in the novel. And so I would work through sections of the plot and then I would run into places where I would see things happening that weren't consistent with my latest version of the character. So then I would have to go back and do a bunch of revision. So that made it a lot more difficult. I think the, the next novel that I'm writing right now currently is in the third person which hopefully makes some of that a little bit less work and I can focus on some other aspects and hopefully that means it'll be done a little bit quicker. I'm not sure, who knows? <laughs> but it, that was definitely the hardest part. Mm -hmm. of, uh, so like in the book you have the, the main event, like the, the sharks saving uh, Nainoa and um, yeah. that event causes like a huge shift within the dy dynamics of the family and we see mm -hmm. how since all of these characters are so distinct, how they all react in like a different way, uh, including uh, Nainoa himself. Um, was it hard also just kind of like deciding on how you wanted those dynamics to be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, that comes back to like each character, right? Having to figure out like, well, you know, who is Cowie and how is she different from Dean and how is Dean different from Nainoa? And given their birth order and what their parents believe, you know, what do all, how, how do all those dynamics play out for each character against the other characters? And so that was, again, you know, the sort of an outgrowth of knowing each character, but each character is influenced by each other character, right? And so you never have a point in which one character is static. It's always a question of this character is both these parts of them internally and also they are, they are both more and exactly the sum of their experiences. And those experiences also come from the other, the other family members. So it was like this constant fluidity of trying to figure out who they were and what their dynamics were against each other. But I think the thing that was, it, it, there was a little bit that was easy about it in the sense that you've got just this one event that you know is gonna be heavily, that's gonna heavily influence each character. And there's some room to, to ask pretty straightforward questions like, well, what happens in a family when one person achieves some level of fame or notoriety or has some sort of special skill that no one else in the family has. What does that do to the, to the dynamics of the family? And, you know, I think the idea of, you know, jealousy and envy and favoritism, those are all very 
very easy answers to that question. So those things came out pretty quickly and those were kind of starting points to being like, okay, well, if, if this one character suddenly receives this great moment that makes them receive more attention and prestige and things like that, then there are going to be issues of favoritism and jealousy. And let me figure out how those would play out within these characters, you know, knowing, knowing who the characters are internally. So mm -hmm. there, was, there was a little bit of ease in that yeah. part of it. <laughs> I felt that that part was also very um, relatable because I, I I have a sister as well and um, not necessarily that there's like this huge power imbalance but it's kind of like you you can recognize that sort of thing like when when one person does something really remarkable and then like all of the intention is set on them for instance so um, yeah mm -hmm. so so w which character was the most fun for you to write for? Uh, so I, I think it would be two, actually. I, I kind of go back and forth between them. So for, first of all, I really enjoyed writing Dean. And the reason I enjoyed writing Dean is because he's so far from who I am as a person. <laughs> and so I, I think the thing that I enjoyed about it is it really challenged me to, I wanted to write a character that essentially, I was like, this is somebody that would have beaten me up if they knew me in high school, <laughs> right? I was like, this is somebody that I would not like. Uh, mm -hmm. If I had met them when I was a teenager, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not a a rich, you know, s sympathetic character that has an internal logic that deserves some level of empathy and relatability. And so there was a a lot of it for me. It was a really big challenge to be like, well, I want to write a character that is that is a character that makes me uncomfortable that I wouldn't I wouldn't like if I met them. But I wouldn't like them because I probably wouldn't understand them as well as they would understand. You know, they're going to have a very different perspective in the world. And is there a way I can draw this character's perspective out? It helps me understand what someone like that might feel like about the world. Uh, so that was really, I really enjoyed that. It was a challenge. But I, I do think it, it, it changed me as a writer, which is fun. I think as a writer, if you have the opportunity while you're writing to become somebody, you know, to, to, to broaden your own perspectives about the world, then that feels just as rewarding as if reading, as if, as if you were reading a book and it broadens your perspective. So I enjoyed that about, about Dean a lot. It was a huge challenge. And there's some things obviously that Dean did that are really ugly and bad that I don't like. And a lot of his internal thoughts were things that I didn't like, but it was important to be, to try and render him honestly and still find a way to render him empathetically. So that was really fun. And then Cowie, I really enjoyed writing because, you know, I consider myself a, a feminist, even if I'm a bad feminist or a failing feminist in, in some people's lives, eyes, or if I, you know, am never quite as, as perfect of a feminist as I would like to be. I think that she was a character that I wanted to write that could speak to some of those sensibilities. I wanted to write a character that in a lot of ways subverted the standard expectations of what a woman is and what a young woman of color is in the United States and, and the place that she is expected to occupy within her family, you know, mm -hmm. as a result of the initial event. And so writing her character was a chance to, to play with those things, uh, which was really fun, right? I wanted to write a character that maybe one day if my girls, or my daughters read the book would be a character that they would be interested in or that they would find fun and, and, and different than other protagonists that they had encountered. So. After you finished um, your first draft, um, how did the editing process look like? Did you have to add a lot of things or did you have to take a lot of stuff out? <laughs> yeah, it was both. That was the thing that was crazy. Oh. So what happened is I would usually write it for a, a long stretch of time and then I would just put the, a draft away. I would get finished with the draft and I would just put it away for months at a time. I would start writing short stories or maybe even not writing, maybe just reading and not even writing for months, you know, maybe like three, four or five months. And then I would pull the draft out and try and, and see it with fresh eyes. And invariably what would happen is I would read the draft, the current draft and be like, well, it's missing some things. Let me put in a bunch of things. And so then I would add things and then I would shelve it for four or five months. And then I would come back to it and be like, there's too much in here. Let me take <laughs> this out. And so it, it kept going back and forth. It kept being too long and then too short and it didn't feel as rich as it needed or it didn't feel nuanced enough. And when I got to a point where I had done that too many times and I started to go crazy, I was just oh. like, I can't, I can't figure out how to make this work. 
-hmm. that was when I finally just realized, well, I've taken this as far. I think I've taken this as far as I can on my own. Mm -hmm. And that was when I took portions of it and passed it to readers, you know, to friends that are writers that were readers. And, and then also just decided to start taking it to agents and see what, what agents responses were. And I just, I just sort of, expected that either somebody would see what I was trying to accomplish and they would help me get it right or else people would look at it and just be like this is a disaster <laughs> <laughs> if, that, if that was the outcome I was willing to be like well then I just failed right I can't I didn't write the thing I could never get it to be what I wanted and I'm just going to move on to something else uh, but luckily the you know the agent that I landed with and the editor that I ended up with both really understood what I was trying to do and, and I was fortunate that they saw that and helped me get it there. Ultimately, I think the draft I sent out was really long, uh, much longer than this. It was, I think, probably, I want to say almost 200 pages longer than the final oh, version of this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but I knew that, right? I knew it was yeah. going to be too long, but I also didn't know what to cut and what to keep. I couldn't figure it out, right? And so I knew it was too long, and I told them that. I was like, yeah, this is too, I know that this is too long, but I need your help in figuring out what we should keep and what we should get rid of. Mm -hmm. And they were very supportive of that, and and I think without, you know, it would never, it wouldn't be the novel it is today without the work of both my agent and my the editors that, that worked through it, which I'm thankful for. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was crazy. I just kept going back and forth. It kept getting too small and too big and too small mm -hmm. and too big. And how is that editing process then, like, with your agent and your editor? Yeah, I, I think the place that it started from was trying to get a sense for what they thought, like, to have them read it independently and then say, well, what do you think this story is about? Mm -hmm. Which parts of this story resonated most strongly with you? You know, just starting from the parts that, that seemed like they had jumped out to to the readers and, and to see the differences, say, between what the agent might believe and what the editor might believe. And then, you know, the, the inverse of that would be like, well, which parts are the weakest or which parts felt like they shouldn't be there? Or where did you get bored? I'm always happy. I love when people are like, I was really bored through here. Like, this is, I'm just really bored. Or if people say they're confused, those are always really good signs that there's a part of it that isn't working uh, and could potentially be thrown out. But I think boredom is a really good one to ask people like, well, what, were you bored? Which part of it did you find the most boring? Because that's, those are the first things you should cut, right? Either you need to like... That means there's something yeah. lacking in uh, the stakes of those moments. And so I think the discussion really started with which parts do you resonate most strongly with you and which parts do you find incredibly boring? Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's where it started. And then from there, it became a question of, as it got smaller, then it became almost a question of, well, are there characters we should get rid of? Uh, and so there were even some characters that are still in the story at a very high level now that were in the story much more directly before, but we just had to cut them. You know, there was a lot more in there about Cowie and Van, for instance, and there was more in there about some relationships Dean had as well that ended up having to get cut. And even Nainoa's relationship with Khadija ended up getting cut significantly. It was, it was much more, there, was, there were more layers to it and there was more interaction between them that, um, based on what was in the book. But those are all places where we ultimately had to cut, right? Those, mm -hmm. those were relationships that I wanted to present in all their richness and nuance, but there's not space for all of those relationships mm -hmm. as well as all the relationships between the siblings and between their parents. Like you just have too many relationships and too many yeah, things. So. Exactly. About like cutting out characters. One thing I noticed was that there's one family member that you don't really get to, um, who doesn't really get a lot of narration time, which is Augie the father. Was that yeah. something that you um, decided from the start or was it something that you had to like cut out sections? Yeah, it, I think by the end of the first draft, it was clear that I, there were some more sections I had written that were from his perspective, <clears throat> but that those went kind of after the first draft. Like after I finished the first draft and came back, his were the ones that, that went first. And that was largely because I think the things that that we were seeing on the page from Augie were, you could get a lot of that from Malia as well, right? It, it didn't necessarily add anything. It was just a separate perspective on the same sort of relationship. And also because of the way Augie changes over the course of the book, it, it was, it became a challenge to figure out how, like to try and render that on the page in a way that didn't make things even more confusing than they already are, right? You know, so the novel is already challenging for people in a lot of ways, and I know that, right? Some of the language that's in there and a lot of the decisions I made about, you know, descriptions of Hawaii or, or you know, beliefs that, that are 
not been fully explained, right? There's no like, there's no glossary or there's no in-depth explanation of all these things. So it was already challenging enough at all those levels. And if I had included some of the things that would have needed to be included for Augie as far as what happens to him over the course of the story, if I had brought those into the foreground more through his own eyes versus the things that we see through Malia, then I think that it would have been even more challenging and confusing for readers. And I, it wouldn't necessarily have added anything. And so, so the Augie's parts went pretty early and I was pretty satisfied with just having him be a character that you see primarily through the eyes of the other characters, mm -hmm. uh, it, except for the end. I think that the way that it ends yeah. up playing out in the end was, was, was a lovely gift that came out after some of the other things from him had been cut. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely like that. We still like at the end because <laughs> I, I was just I turned the page and it was like, oh, I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> <We're finally laughs> getting to to see like his perspective. Um, and like, as you said, like in the book, we also get some insight on Hawaiian history, culture, um, like, for instance, the collapse of the sugarcane industry, um, but also the effects of uh, colonialism and uh, there's a point in the book where um, Malia uh, touches on this if um, I can find it yeah so uh, where did it go oh yeah here page 181 yeah so she says um, uh, ships from far ports carried a new god in their bellies a god who blew a breath of weeping blisters and fevers that torched whole generations a god uh, whose fingers were shaped like rifles and voice sounded like treaties waiting to be broken so um, whether whether certain parts of Hawaiian history and like specifically like relating to colonialism um, and the consequences that came with that. Um, were there like certain pieces that you felt very strongly about including? Yeah, yeah, and I think those are the pieces, just the thing that you read is a perfect example of that. Those, a lot of those come through, there's sort of, there's sort of two sets of things that, that I ended up thinking were, were important parts of this novel to have sort of important parts about Hawaii that I thought this novel should or, or could express. And one of those is, is just a little bit of the idea of the way Hawaii was before European contact and, and how that changed afterwards. And that primarily comes out, you, you know, the, the sort of voice of the islands and the historical things that, that Malia speaks to um, talk about that, but I think for a lot of people, they still don't really know the history of Hawaii and that it was a sovereign kingdom with a, you know, a functioning monarchy and a people that had an entirely sustainable set of beliefs and practices and a, a complex society that was entirely of their own making that was swept away largely by a really small set of interests from the United States, right? It essentially was a, a very small set of agricultural barons that wanted to turn Hawaii into an, an agricultural export for the greater United States. And those things were tied up with the, you know, the War of 1812 and the Civil War that was happening in the United States at the time. But it just became a thing that, that was violently pulled into the United States in a way that I don't think a lot of people realize. And I thought it was really important to, at some level, speak to that because that, that is the, one of the strongest, I don't know, points of friction or, or, or the dichotomy of, of Hawaii as a part of the United States that is inescapable, in my opinion. Like if you grow up in, in Hawaii, you just feel that. Like it's just all around you, the obviousness of, of there having been a sovereign nation at one point that was almost entirely annihilated by by American interests, right? And that there has also been a very strong pushback, and there there is a now very ascendant culture in Hawaii of you know like a return to those belief systems and to make those forefront and and a more central part of, of the existence in Hawaii. But there was a time in which the language was outlawed in which things like hula were outlawed. And, and the novel tries to speak to those things. And, and also I hope it, those things come out subtly in a lot of the characters' interactions with people, you know, like when Kaui is, is with her friends and they ask her about, you know, about like what it was like growing up in the islands or when Dean 
is is playing in a basketball game and at halftime they have it it's like a hawaiian night or whatever at the basketball game you know and so there are some other aspects of that that came out subtly but certainly with malia she speaks to it very uh very directly but i thought it was really important to to make sure that that was a strong part of the novel so that people that otherwise didn't realize the way that that hawaii was brought into the united states they would hopefully come away with a slightly different opinion of, of the country. So there was that part of it, but I did also want to celebrate the aspects of of native Hawaiian mythology and, and of the belief system that I also, you know, it was a, it was a very big part of my my life growing up. You just experience growing up there when people talk about you know the gods of Hawaii or things like that. Um, I wanted to bring those into the novel as well because I think they're very interesting and fascinating and and an important aspect of the culture that is also, you know, it's 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 something new. I also just wanted I wanted to talk about that part of growing up in Hawaii and what it felt like to be in a place where you have those belief systems and the idea of these ancient gods is still an idea. These are ideas that are very valuable and alive in the state of Hawaii today for a lot of people. And there's something you just encounter in your daily life. Mm-hmm. And those are, you know, they're enriching, they're valuable. I think there's something that we should pay more attention to, but they're also, it's just very interesting, right? It's interesting and, and, and fun to read about. And, and so I wanted to include those aspects as well, even though at some level I was concerned there might be a risk of, I don't, exoticizing Hawaii or making people all of a sudden be like, oh yes, here's this exotic, you know, remote island culture that I don't really understand and it's magical. And you know, that that side of things, mm-hmm. there's a risk that a story like this could just reinforce negative stereotypes. But I don't think it has to, and so I challenged myself to include those elements in a way that made it not feel like that, to make it not feel like an exoticization or something that that was reductive of the culture the same time so mm-hmm. yeah because one of the things i've recently become very interested in is like being mindful of um other people's uh realities because like i know in the west we're always kind of like seeing everything from this western perspective and not really um i would say like equally appreciating everyone else's like non-western realities and perspectives yeah um so i was wondering what do you think are like the biggest differences between like uh, a hawaiian perspective on life and that of like the west because i know here there's a huge focus on the individual how can you improve yourself and uh, i guess it's always about moving up in society so how's that in hawaii yeah, it's very that's very insightful that 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 you recognize that there's some element of that in in this novel in terms of individualism and and that Western ideal. And that's one of the things that I I hope the novel speaks to in in an important way because that's one of the things that I think in a lot of certainly my own experiences with multiple indigenous cultures, not only Hawaiian cultures, but some of the other ones I've encountered in the world you know, having lived abroad in, in different places, there's much less emphasis on the individual. The idea of the individual as paramount or or more important than the the collective is something that a lot of other cultures, it's just like a totally the opposite, right? It's more a question of, you know, trying to recognize what your role and what your responsibility is to the larger to the larger community of which you are part. There's a term in in the Hawaiian language, uh, kuleana, right? Which is it can be a lot of different things. It's a very rich word. A lot of a lot of the words in in Hawaiian are very rich words, and they have multiple meanings. And, and kuleana is one of those words as well. But one way you could think of it is that sense of responsibility, the sense of 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 recognizing your interconnectedness and what the implications of that interconnectedness are. And that's something that I think is is central to Hawaiian culture and is very much like my experience in America is very much like, well, this your story is your story and you know your job is to maximize yourself and your your potential. And the question of of whether you have responsibilities to a larger community, whether that's your family or the neighborhood you grew up in or all those different things is is secondary to that. Right. And most of the most of the messaging we get is about maximizing the self without questions about the larger community, you know, or your interconnectedness to other things. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that I wanted to talk about in the novel and that I think is, 
I've encountered in, in several different indigenous cultures, and it's something that's missing in Western culture. Certainly, I can speak mostly to American culture because I've been I've lived in that for the longest. But it's something that's missing in, in American culture, and something that I think that we need to. It's going to be one of the defining challenges, in my opinion, of the 21st century, yeah. is how do we reconcile that sort of narrative, which I think is largely a false narrative, with the realities of things like climate change, where you can see that we cannot ignore the interconnectedness of things. It's impossible. And, and so there needs to be a reconciliation with regards to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely, uh, I could definitely relate to that because like, um, I, my parents are Nigerian and um, I grew up in the Netherlands. So um, like at home, I had this very uh, strong sense of like family is very important, like collective, um, like you you don't view yourself as an individual you always think about like okay my sister my mother my grandmother and respect for like ancestors and things like that and then you walk out of the door and it's all these type of it's it's even like those small things that you're like hmm okay i don't think i would do, would have done that or or that it's kind of feels like okay that's a bit self-centered so it was yeah. interesting to see that also um, in this book. And um, so, I, cause I've been doing uh, a bit of research on Hawaii when I was like reading the book as well. And oh, I- Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, and <laughs> one thing I noticed, um, of course, is that the history of Hawaii itself is distinctively, like, distinctly different from all the other states, uh, all of the other yeah. American states and also um, as a result, the population's demographic is completely uh, different. And, yes. uh, and also in the book, like, how is race looked at in Hawaii? And, like, and how is that, like, different? How does that differ in, in the States? Yeah, yeah. This is something that there are people that study race issues that would be able to speak to this in a much better way than I will. I will try, but I will probably <laughs> fail to describe it as well as, as you know, a scholar on, on race and history in the United States and with specificity to, to Hawaii could. There was a great New York Times article, or at least I thought it was great. It's contentious. A lot of people don't think it was great, but it, it tried to speak to that because Hawaii, it, this, and this is certainly one of the things that I've experienced is that like when I grew up in Hawaii, everybody that I grew up around was a mix of multiple races and so the idea of race was something totally different because most people were some mix of you know korean chinese filipino puerto rican you know african european and pacific all these different pacific island you know races or ethnicities it, it truly was that was just the way it was like almost nobody i knew was 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 a single race or ethnicity yeah so you know just most people i grew up around were were truly, you know, they just had multiple ethnic and racial identities. They just spanned a lot of different races. There were uh, several waves of immigrants to Hawaii in particular that worked on the agricultural sector and the railroads that came about as a result of the agricultural sector that were from different parts of Asia, right? And so you have most people's, you know, their race might span, you know, Filipino, Chinese, Hawaiian, Puerto Rican, or, or some combination of even greater numbers of immigrants that arrived at later dates. You know, there are very strong ties between Japan and Hawaii as well. And, and so everybody I grew up around was a mix of these different ethnicities and, and, and the, the cultural makeup of the state is very different as a result. There are, there's a mix of all these different traditions that a lot of people are familiar with. Like, so even though I'm not Japanese, I had friends that practiced some of the sort of traditional Japanese um, you know, like cultural touchstones that that I was just exposed to because that's where you know my friends. I had friends that were like you know Japanese, Chinese, or things like that 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 gave me exposure to those things. And and the number of people that were primarily what we would refer to as as white, which I don't like as a term. If we were to say like European American or or things like that, they were the minority in the state. And certainly where I grew up, they were the minority. And so the, the power dynamics and the racial dynamics were totally inverted, right? And so one of the things that coming to the continental United States made was that, that was challenging about coming to this to the continental United States was that all of a sudden was inverted and there was this this sort of ignorance and and lack of exposure to a wider set of ethnicities that 
I didn't, it was, it was very uncomfortable. It was very hard to, to interact with people that had had such a less rich and varied experience with other ethnicities and races and therefore had all of these blind spots or, or, you know, prejudices and things like that, that it it just feels, it sometimes feels like it's too much to try and overcome, to try and span that difference, to try and find a way to, to reconcile the two at the same time. And so it does also lead to a lot of, you know, I've, I've struggled with feelings at time of isolation or just feeling very different than a lot of people that I'll be in a room with because I came from such a different place. And I myself am, am a mix of different races, right? My, my father is, I guess we would consider European-American. My mother is, is African-American. And you can trace my mother's lineage back to at least my understanding of this. I haven't bothered to really dig in with like, you know, a genetic test or anything. But my understanding is that my lineage traces through to African slaves that were brought to the American South. And so there's that side of things. And then there's having grown up in, in Hawaii and having all those things together and then going out to the continent of the United States where everything was completely inverted and, and the, which group was the ethnic minority and which group was the ethnic majority and how that played out and what the cultural experiences were. It's just entirely different. And so it's hard. It's a very hard experience in a lot of ways. Hi, that's so interesting to me because like um, the way I, or at least like I think most of the people in the West see America as this um, place that is like diversity is celebrated and like there's so many different ethnicities. Um, in a sense, it's true that there are a lot of those uh, different ethnicities, different types of people, but it all seems like so clustered up that you have like these different types of, I, I guess, like power dynamics or like this it's not like homogeneously like diverse so to speak right Mm -hmm. yeah 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 yeah, exactly and and there are some other things that just they didn't play out and i don't want to i don't want to paint the picture that hawaii is some sort of you know that it is exempt from issues of racism or classism or things like that because those things are obviously still very much alive and both the, the native Hawaiian population and many other populations that have come at different points in time have experienced their own versions of racism and classism within Hawaii, even though there is a much more fluid idea of, of race and ethnicity and not the same power dynamics, there still are issues of classism and racism. So, you know, Hawaii is not exempt uh, from those things uh, either. What is a habit uh, you think that has helped you the most in your writing career? I think, so there's there's two things I would say. One of those is just like a, a discipline of, of wanting to, of just making it a daily thing. And, I, you know, different different people write different ways. So every artist kind of has their own way that they do their work and feels most productive. Some people write in huge spurts all at once and then they don't write for weeks or months at a time. And they're actually doing work in their heads, but they're not sitting at a you know keyboard typing away. And then they come back and all of these things that they've been working on in their head, they can get out on the page effectively. But that's never really worked for me. And so the thing that that has been most effective for me is to make it a daily undertaking almost as if it were another job which i think at one level is not exciting like turning (laughs) art into something that becomes like a daily commitment Mm -hmm. can be can take some of the magic and the fun away from it but i I think it's important if you're in the middle of trying to write something at least for me i find it most productive if i'm engaging with it on a daily basis if i'm forcing myself to sit down and try and make something happen in this story then I carry that around with me the rest of the day, especially if I do it early in the morning. And so then things that I need to work out in my head are work result of me having tried to get something done during, during this block of time. So that's been very important. Trying to make it a daily habit is when I end up being most productive. And I think the other thing is also finding tricks to get around what might otherwise be when people talk about writer's block, I think that it's really just fear. You get, it's, you get in a situation where you have something you want to try but you're scared to do it wrong, right? You have a, you have this a perfect idea of what you want to, to say. And then when you try to get it out, you're scared that the thing you're doing is totally wrong or it's not right. And so I, I just have a lot of little things that I do to, to force myself to keep going, even though I know whatever I'm writing is bad or is not what I want to write. Uh, and so I apply those all the time. Dialogue is a perfect example. Sometimes when I have characters and they're in a scene and they need to talk to each other and I know that they need to they need to do things to each other with their dialogue, right? They need to they need to uplift each other or they need to hurt each other or they need to try and get information from each other or, or those sorts of things. 
but you can't just have them do that. It has to be really subtle, right? Because that's not how people interact. People interact with a lot of, you know, they mask their true intentions and they say there's the subtext, there's what's said and then there's the subtext. So a lot of times for something like that, when I get in scenes where there's a lot of dialogue and I'm really locked up because I'm like, well, they need to say something, but they need to not say the thing that they really <laughs> want. Uh, I will actually just write down, you know, I'll put markers in the page so that I know I need to come back and fix it. And then I'll have a block of dialogue where they're literally saying the thing they need to do to each other. So somebody will come in the room or whatever and say, like, I am angry with you because you hurt my sister three weeks ago. And now I'm going to take revenge on you by making you hurt with this thing. You know, it's a literally in dialogue quotes. They will say uh -huh. that thing. But that's fine because then I can move it forward. And I know I'm going to come back and fix that and make those words be the right words. But it helps me figure out, well, what are these people trying to, what is this scene trying to accomplish in terms of the interactions? And let me get that part of it out. And then I'll come back and make the words be the words they need to be. And so there are little tricks like that I use in a lot of spaces when I get, when I get locked up to make me keep writing, even though I know that the writing, the first, the first words that get down are not going to be the right words. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the thing that's also nice is that I can just feel like nobody else has to read this and never have to show this to anybody else. You know, I could just write this badly in my room by myself and not be ashamed of it and then fix it before anybody else sees it. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like a, such a great way of like, like getting, I guess, past writer's block in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be different things. You know, sometimes it could be deeper than, than a sense of just like basic fear. I don't want to, you know, people, it's such a different experience for different people. I don't want to make anybody feel guilty or feel like they are not doing something right. If they feel like they have a true writer's block, I'm not blaming a writer for having yeah. writer's block, but I'm just saying that I'm always finding anytime I, I feel like the thing that's holding me back is some level of fear. Then I just try and push through that by, by, let, letting myself like forgiving myself for doing a bad job at first <laughs> <laughs> so uh the last uh, question before the quick fire question is how did you come up with the title yeah that was you know that was a, that was a really hard one um i wanted to i wanted to figure out a way to point at some level to the islands right to give people an idea that the book was about Hawaii without using any of the stereotypical images, but also to speak to the larger issues I hoped the novel spoke about, which were, you know, ideas of some of the things we talked about earlier, like individualism versus collectivism and, and you know, um, hopes and fantasies as as sometimes being a way that we tell ourselves things about the world that they don't end up being. And, and so it was really hard for me to figure out, well, what are some words and images that express those sorts of things, right? And so I knew also that at some level, you've got these sharks that are kind of symbolic of some of the larger things. And so having a title that speaks to those is important. But, you know, what are what are some of the other things that, that, that these sharks can kind of be placed in contrast with in a surprising way? And one of those things is to think about sharks. Like when people think about sharks, they don't think about them as, as companions or as friendly <laughs> forces, right? There's, it's just fear. It's just abject fear. And you're like, a shark is going to kill me. It's not going to save me. We are not in any way. I do not want to be with a shark. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to figure out a way that maybe kind of put those two things together in a, in a surprising way. I played with it for a long time. I had a lot of other titles that, that I went back and forth on. But much like the drafts, I got to a point where I tried a bunch of different titles and I could just find something wrong with every one of the titles. Mm -hmm. And so finally, I just put a title on it that I thought worked okay, that was somewhat intriguing. And then I sent, you know, when I sent it to, to the agents and editors, I kept telling them, I was like, if this title is not good, please help me come up with a better title. And everybody just ignored my emails. I would send that in emails and everybody endlessly ignored it. So I just assumed that everybody thought the title was good enough. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where there are, I'm sure there are better titles out there. I don't think I am. I, I, man, some people are really good at good titles. <laughs> and I am not that person. <laughs> So I did the best I could to find something that I thought spoke to the complexity while also having an interesting juxtaposition of the idea of a shark and a savior. And when you put those things together in that title, you're sort of like, well, but I don't think of sharks as say like, you know, it gives you something to think about and makes you want to, it wants, makes you want to engage with the, the story. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I never really, <laughs> was never comfortable with the title. I was always like, I'm sure somebody out there is much smarter about titles. And if they could just read this book and give me a better <laughs> title, then it'll sell a billion copies. You know? so. 
<laughs> well, now now it's a bit too late to change the title. So I know. <laughs> So you'll be on tour and like this guy comes up and he's like, I thought this would be a good title. And you'd be like, oh, exactly. damn it. <laughs> there's always, I know, right? But there's always that guy too. There's always somebody that's going to have a better title and it's not yeah. going to have a title, you know, anything like that. There will always be, there are already people that have pointed out things that I thought I had caught where there are like inconsistencies. I think there are a couple of scenes where like somebody walks into a room and they're like, wait, but you, but like three sentences earlier, you said the lights off, but then they walk into the room and it's dark. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I caught that. Yeah, it's that never perfect. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now for the quick fire questions, if you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, what was your favorite childhood book? A graphic novel. It was called Elf Quest. It's the earliest one I can think of that I was totally in love with. It was by an author named Wendy Peeney. Her husband helped to write it, Richard. It's a set of graphic novels. Yeah, it's about these, it's like this fantastical world in which there are these main characters that are elves and they're trying to find their way back to to their to their past, sort of. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what's your favorite reading spot? Hmm. Anywhere that is, anywhere that is quiet and and pleasant to sit in. You know, I, I, I have to read everywhere. I have to read on the bus. I have to read on planes or while I'm waiting in line at the grocery store. I can't remember the last time I got to sit down for a large chunk of time in one place and read. But I guess I could say like the classic one of just being on a couch. Uh -huh. You know, being on a couch at home where it's quiet and nobody's around and I can just kind of read in like comfortable clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so no music, no ambiance? <laughs> no, not even for my writing. In fact, the, the publisher of this, um, you know, the publisher of Sharks and Time of Saviors in the United States, FSG, they, they're they putting together, I'm putting together a playlist that goes along with it. And they, when they first approached me, they were like, well, do you want to put together a playlist for this? And I'm like, if it's supposed to be music that I was listening to while I was writing, I listened to total silence. Like I put on noise canceling headphones and there was just silence. <laughs> I was like, if you're looking for a playlist, it's going to be silence uh, so no i have to i have to read and write in total silence i can't do like if there's like a ca like a cafe or something like i can't do it it's just not mm -hmm. <laughs> so who is your favorite writer oh there's there's just no way there's no way there are too many um you know and it, it's so funny i think it changes over time right like you can have like sometimes i think that the the right book finds you at the right time and that will feel like a lovely book until you find another one, until you kind of outgrow that book or you change and then there's another book that comes along. And so I think it's kind of a confluence of where you are as a person at that given time, and what book happens to reach you at that moment. And that changes over time, right? Because there's books now that I, I loved when I was younger that are I, I, they're not the same now. And I'm sure there are books that I didn't like when I was younger that if I go back to now, they could be, they could speak to that totally differently. But I guess just a couple of the authors I could say that I, I love the most because they gave me those moments that, that totally changed the way I thought about literature were. Uh, so I mentioned Dennis Johnson earlier. That was a huge one. Mm -hmm. There was, um, you know, Toni Morrison. I, I just can't get around. Like Toni Morrison, I feel like was the first author whose work I read that gave me permission to, to, to write for an unexpected audience. To, to think about the audience for a book and who I think that like the reader of this book is and to write to them regardless of what external forces are telling you a book has to be about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say those two. I could think of many more, but those are two that I could think of that were very influential at, at different times for me as a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've um, heard a lot of people have mentioned uh, Toni Morrison. Yeah, uh, yeah, she's the, yeah. Like, she is the like the queen of, in my opinion, of like especially American literature. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to say worldwide necessarily, but she is just like she's just like an unrivaled creative force. Like probably one of the most important writers I would say in in the history of the American novel. Like yeah. just like, unquestionably. So especially if you're a writer of of color or somebody that's writing from a community that does not normally have itself in the kind of common writing spaces, right? I think she's the person that really broke through in this incredibly intelligent, powerful way. She, she broke ground for so many of us. Like, I'm incredibly grateful yes. um, for, for her work. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. All right, this is supposed to be quick fire. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so besides anything book related, uh, what do you enjoy as a pastime? Spending time in in the outdoors. I do the one part of myself that I feel like showed up pretty pretty directly in the novel was rock climbing. So I used to do a ton of rock climbing and mountaineering. But even just hiking or going for long bike rides in in green spaces are that's the, anytime I get a chance to do that, it's it's lovely. Uh, that that's a huge one, and I, I'll just take that one. That's a pretty yeah. big one. <laughs> And um, what's the best writing advice you were ever given? I think that it's less writing advice and more, I spoke to it earlier, right? Just doing the thing on a daily basis, right? Like doing your art on a daily basis, even when it's bad, but like, especially when it's bad. And that actually came from my father. My father's a musician. He's a public school teacher. And a long time ago, he talked about how much better he got as a musician when he just sat down and practiced every day. And he's like, yeah, that seems like it's really straightforward advice. But he's like, just every day, if I just do it every day for a little bit, if I get up in the morning before the day starts and I play the piano for 30 minutes, I'm so much better now than I was you know, 10 years ago because I do that. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the same way I feel about writing. I think it works for probably any art. Yeah, I guess it's like just the, the thing of like, if you don't try, you won't improve, so. Yeah, yeah, and I think that there are other things that come out as a result of that, right? You learn to just be okay with, with the bad days, right? Mm-hmm. And just accept them as part of the process. I mean, everything I've ever wanted to do well, I did badly at first. I have never been gifted at anything. I wish I knew what that was like. <laughs> but I have never picked up something and been like, oh, I was really good at that right away, or within like three weeks, all of a sudden, I was really good at the thing. And I've seen people do that, right? So I know it is, it is a reality in the world. Mm-hmm. which is very daunting sometimes but i've met you know i could still think of there was a girl that was in one of my classes in college or i guess at that point you know she, there was a woman that was in one of my classes in college uh that was really good at math she was so smart at math i just could not keep up with her you know it was in one of my advanced math classes and the teacher would you know the professor would bring in work he would go over the 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 principles of whatever this new mathematical thing was we were doing, we would have homework and I would struggle for hours. Mm-hmm. And she just, she got it so quickly. It was amazing. It was, mm-hmm. It's like being around brilliant people is, is incredibly humbling and exciting, but I'm not one of those people. So <laughs> practice is all that's ever worked for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, what was the best book you read last year and which book are you most looking forward to this year? It, it's a book last year that I read called All the Names They Used for God by I, I think her name is Anjali Sakdeva. I'm probably mispronouncing it, for which I apologize. But yeah, all the names they use for God. It's a collection of short stories. She's just like, the short stories span all these incredible different, almost like fantastical events. It, it's such a great collection. I love it. And it got good praise, but like, yeah, it's fantastic. One of the, easily the best book I ever read last year. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the one that you're looking forward to this year? There's so many good ones coming out, and there's some from last year that I still um, mm-hmm. haven't read. You know, I have Paul Yoon's most recent book. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus, the title right now is, is slipping my mind. And it's on my shelf, and it's probably Something the next book. Something with running, right? I think. Yeah, uh-huh. Run Me to the Earth. I think Run Me to the Earth. Mm-hmm. And Run Me to Earth. One of those two. It's his. It's his latest novel, uh, which I'm. I'm very excited to read it. It's Gorgeous cover. He's such a great writer. Right? Yeah. It's, it's going to be really cool. Last quick fire question. Um, any suggestion for a Hawaiian literature or like interesting folk tales? Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole range of things you can get. If you're looking for kind of more exposure to native Hawaiian mythology, there are a couple of books. I actually think I have one right here. Hold on. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. It's by Martha, Martha Beckwith. There's a book on... Hawaiian Mythology by Martha Beckwith. That is an excellent one for if you're looking for some of those older older tales. And then for contemporary authors, I think I mentioned a couple of them before, but Kiana Davenport's books, uh, Lois N. Yamanaka. Um, so uh, now my final, final question. Um, so you are going on yeah. tour in a couple of days, um, talking about um, sharks, of course, uh, which is very exciting. Um, my question is, uh, what are you most looking forward to uh, discussing about the book? 
I'm hoping to find a way to talk about the, the connections I see between what the book talks about and things that we need to address more directly in the United States in particular. A really good example is climate change, right? I work, I work on, I actively work on climate policy, uh, doing lobbying work at both the, the state and federal level to get policies put in place to help offset the problems we're seeing now and in the future with, with carbon emissions. And so I'm hoping I'll have a chance to talk about how this book speaks to the need to return to the interconnectedness that humans and the, the natural world have, and that we need to find a way to live sustainably with the, the natural world if we want, you know, if we want human society and civilization to continue in a way that is recognizable to how it is now, mm -hmm. uh, we, need to, we need to really start to, to change the way that, that we live in the world. And so I'm hoping I get a chance to talk about that without being too, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to get up on a soapbox and like preach to people. And a lot of people are showing up and they're just gonna be like, man, I just want to hear about the book. I want to hear about, <laughs> hear about opinions songs. about policy, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm hoping to find a way to work those things in and in without, you know, like beating people over the head with it or anything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely very important, of course. Yeah, so those were all of uh, the questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Um, I had a lovely time uh, talking to you. It was so much fun. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for the book to come out so that more people can talk about it. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for taking the time for talking with me and having great questions and it, it just talking about books is nice, right? Talking exactly. with people about books is great. I love talking with people about, not about my book, but just about <laughs> books in general. Mm -hmm. Such a, such a fun, fun art form. Exactly. So, thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. So, um, well, that was the end uh, of a book chat with Kawhi Strong Washburn. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. A huge thank you to Barbara, Chris, Diane, Jen, Nikolai and Tara for supporting me over on Patreon.